What's better than listening to the Radiology Review? Nothing. Well, true. But you could buy our book, The Board Exam Study Guide, Episodes 1 through 101, available for purchase as a book on Amazon or in Kindle version. Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast. This episode is a neuroradiology topic focusing on the cranial foramina. This is a high-yield topic that is often tested, and I hope this episode will be helpful for many of you. I do want to take a moment to discuss the book from the Radiology Review, now available on Amazon or in Kindle version, that contains the study guides to the educational podcast episodes from episode 1 through 101 that I put out there due to the fact that there are now so many study guides that for those who want to print and read these, it is becoming cumbersome. My hope is that making this available on Amazon will be convenient and help fill this need for many of you so you can simply listen to the podcast episodes, readily find the corresponding show notes, and have a place for you to review and write down your own notes according to your individual study needs. If you prefer to continue to access these study guides at my website, theradiologyreview.com, these will remain free on the website, and I do plan to continue to release these study guides for new episodes, including the current episode, on my website for free download as soon as they are posted. Note that this book is available in the U.S. on Amazon, as well as many additional countries. So if you are interested, go ahead and check that out. There is a link on my website, theradiologyreview.com. Without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the foramen ovale? The answer I'm looking for is that the foramen ovale contains the mandibular division branch of the trigeminal nerve that is also simply abbreviated commonly as V3, as well as the lesser petrosal nerve, the inferior otic ganglion, and sometimes the meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve, which is also sometimes called the nervous spinosis. However, the nervous spinosus more commonly passes through the foramen spinosum. In terms of arteries, the foramen ovale contains the accessory meningeal artery. If you add the veins, there is a helpful mnemonic of ovale, O-V-A-L-E, O for otic ganglion, V for V3, A for accessory meningeal artery, L for lesser petrosal nerve, and E for emissary veins. Next question, what are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the foramen spinosum? Well, if you are paying attention, I already gave you one answer, which is the meningeal branch of the mandibular nerve, which is also sometimes termed the nervous spinosus. It is most commonly found passing through the foramen spinosum. And you should also remember that the middle meningeal artery is the primary arterial structure typical for the foramen spinosum. Next question. What are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the foramen rotundum? The answer I am looking for here is the V2 branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is the maxillary branch, as well as the artery of the foramen rotundum. Remember, V2 passes through the foramen rotundum, and V3 passes through the foramen ovale. Remembering the anatomy of the trigeminal nerve branches is particularly high yield because I think for one reason, 
that writing test questions on this topic is very easy. A trick that helps me remember this and bear with me is rotundum, R-O-T-W-O-N-D-U-M, rotundum. That's how I remembered that V2 passes through the foramen rotundum, or more accurately, rotundum. Next, what are the typical nerve, arterial, and venous contents of the superior orbital fissure? In terms of nerves, you should know that the trochlear nerve, abducens nerve, oculomotor nerve, and the lacrimal, frontal, and nasociliary nerves pass through the superior orbital fissure. Of those, it is more important to remember the cranial nerves, but I have listed others here as well in case you want to go above and beyond perhaps. In terms of the arteries that pass through the superior orbital fissure, there really are no major arteries that typically pass through there, so that is a trick question. In terms of veins passing through the superior orbital fissure, I would remember that the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein branches pass through the superior orbital fissure. Next, what are the osseous boundaries of the superior orbital fissure? In terms of the superior boundary of the superior orbital fissure, this is made up by the lesser wing of the sphenoid, and the greater wing of the sphenoid makes up the inferior boundary of the superior orbital fissure. So those are inversed in that the superior has the lesser wing and the inferior has the greater wing of the sphenoid. At the medial aspect of the superior orbital fissure is the sphenoid bone proper itself, and at the lateral aspect is the frontal bone. Next, what are the typical nerve, arterial, and venous contents of the inferior orbital fissure? In terms of nerves, the infraorbital nerve, zygomatic nerve, orbital branches, and the orbital branches of the pterygopalatine ganglion pass through the inferior orbital fissure. In terms of arteries, you should remember that the infraorbital artery passes through the inferior orbital fissure. And in terms of veins, you have branches of the inferior ophthalmic vein. So to review, through the superior orbital fissure, you have branches of the superior and inferior ophthalmic vein, and through the inferior orbital fissure, you can have branches of the inferior ophthalmic vein. Next question. What are the typical contents of the optic canal? Typical contents of the optic canal that I would remember for radiology board exams are the ophthalmic artery and the optic nerve. Remember that the optic nerve does not pass through either the superior or inferior orbital fissure, but rather through the optic canal. Next, true or false? The internal carotid artery passes through the foramen lacerum. The answer here is false. The internal carotid artery passes by the superior aspect of the foramen lacerum, and that segment is termed the lacerum segment of the internal carotid artery, but it does not in fact traverse through the foramen lacerum. I think that is important to remember because it can be confusing in that one would assume that the lacerum segment of the internal carotid artery would pass through the foramen lacerum, but it, in fact, only approaches it, but does not pass through it. Next, what are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the foramen lacerum? Ascending pharyngeal artery branches and the greater petrosal nerve, which is sometimes termed the deep petrosal nerve, pass through the foramen lacerum where they merge and then exit as the nerve of the pterygoid canal. Next, through which opening does the internal carotid artery enter the skull base?
I have already told you that the internal carotid artery does not enter through the foramen lacerum. So where does it enter? And the answer is logically the carotid canal. Next, what are the typical contents of the supraorbital foramen? The answer I'm looking for is that the appropriately named supraorbital artery, vein, and nerve pass through the supraorbital foramen. And I just want to make sure and point out that you not only have superior and inferior orbital fissures, but you also have supraorbital and infraorbital foramen. So do not confuse these. Next, what are the typical contents of the infraorbital foramen? The answer I'm looking for here is that the, again, appropriately named infraorbital artery, vein, and nerve pass through the infraorbital foramen. You may also want to remember as a bonus that the infraorbital nerve then gives off the superior alveolar nerves. So if you have a patient with history of trauma to the face and they give you a stem that there is loss of sensation to some of the maxillary teeth, you should consider one potential explanation as a fracture through the infraorbital foramen. Next question. What are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the pterygoid canal? The answer I am looking for here is the vidian nerve and the vidian artery. Note that the pterygoid canal is also sometimes called the vidian canal. Next, what are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the stylomastoid foramen? The answer I'm looking for here is that the facial nerve and the stylomastoid artery pass through the stylomastoid foramen. Next, what are the typical nerve and vascular contents of the jugular foramen? Through the jugular foramen pass the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory nerves and the jugular bulb and internal jugular vein. Next, what are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the internal auditory canal? Through the internal auditory canal pass the facial nerve, vestibulocochlear nerve, vestibular ganglion, and the labyrinthine artery. Sometimes board exams expect you to know how the nerves are positioned within the internal auditory canal. A mnemonic that can help you remember this is 7 up, coke down, meaning that the facial nerve, which is the seventh cranial nerve, will lie superior in the internal auditory canal, and the cochlear nerve will lie inferior in the internal auditory canal. Next question. What are the typical nerve and arterial contents of the foramen magnum? In terms of nerves, you have one really big nerve, in a way, which is the medulla oblongata. You also have the accessory nerve spinal root, and you have the vertebral and anterior and posterior spinal arteries that all pass through the foramen magnum. Next. How does the hypoglossal nerve exit the cranium? The answer I'm looking for here is through the hypoglossal canal. Next question. Through which foramina do the V1, V2, and V3 branches of the trigeminal nerve exit the skull? I've already reviewed a few of these, but let's make sure that you have this down. V1 exits the skull through the superior orbital fissure, V2 through the foramen rotundum, and V3 through the foramen ovale. The cranial nerve courses and anatomy is high yield for the core exam and potentially clinically useful. I'm going to quickly give a rundown of the 12 cranial nerves. 
to help you review. Cranial nerve one, which is the olfactory nerve, exits the skull through the cribriform plate. Cranial nerve two, which is the optic nerve, exits the skull through the optic foramen. Cranial nerve three, which is the oculomotor nerve, exits through the superior orbital fissure. Cranial nerve four, the trochlear nerve, exits also through the superior orbital fissure. Cranial nerve five, the trigeminal nerve, has three different exits for the three major branches. As I said, V1, the ophthalmic branch through the superior orbital fissure, V2, the maxillary branch through the foramen rotundum, and V3, the mandibular branch through the foramen ovale. Cranial nerve six, the abducens nerve exits through the superior orbital fissure as well. So through the superior orbital fissure, you have cranial nerve three, cranial nerve four, V1 of cranial nerve five, and cranial nerve six. Cranial nerve seven, the facial nerve exits through the stylomastoid foramen. Cranial nerve eight, the vestibulocopier nerve exits through the internal auditory canal. Cranial nerve nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve exits through the jugular foramen. Cranial nerve 10, the vagus nerve, also through the jugular foramen. Cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, also through the jugular foramen, with the notable addition that the accessory nerve spinal root exits through the foramen magnum. And cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, exits through the hypoglossal canal. Actually, I need to clarify this a little bit. The spinal accessory nerve branches actually originate in the cervical spinal cord and caudal medulla oblongata, and these actually ascend through the foramen magnum and then exit the cranium through the jugular foramen. There is a great mnemonic to remember the cranial nerves in order, if that is something you don't have down yet, and it is on, 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 they traveled and found Voldemort guarding very ancient horcruxes. If you are unfamiliar with Harry Potter, that will not make any sense. If you know the stories, it should make sense. On, on, on are the three O's for olfactory, optic, and oculomotor. They traveled are two T's for trochlear and trigeminal nerve. And found Voldemort stands for abducens, facial, and vestibular cochlear nerve guarding very ancient horcruxes for vestibular cochlear nerve, glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, and accessory nerve, and finally, hypoglossal nerve. I did not create this. It is all over online if you search for this, and I'm presenting it here because it's a great mnemonic for those who know the stories. Next question. What is the Dorello Canal? D-O-R-E-L-L-O. The Dorello Canal is a canal that allows the abducens nerve to traverse between the pontine cistern and the cavernous sinus. I find for whatever reason that the course of the abducens nerve is one that is commonly tested, and I simply want to point out what the Dorello Canal is in case you ever encounter that. Next, what is the typical clinical significance of the sphenopalatine foramen? The sphenopalatine foramen is kind of complex in many ways, but for radiology board exams, I would consider this as a potential pathway for perineural spread from the nasal cavity through its opening by the superior nasal meatus to the pterygopalatine fossa. So again, the sphenopalatine foramen is a potential pathway for perineural spread from the nasal cavity into the pterygopalatine fossa. Last and final question for this episode. What are the typical nerve and vascular contents of the sphenopalatine foramen? In terms of nerves, the nasopalatine nerve and posterior superior nasal nerve pass through the sphenopalatine foramen. In terms of vessels, the sphenopalatine artery and sphenopalatine vein pass through the sphenopalatine foramen. That is a lot of information coming your way. I would suggest reviewing this content in written form. 
I will make the study guide for this episode available for free download on my website, theradiologyreview.com, so check it out there. Remember to follow at RadRevPodcast on Twitter or Instagram, where we post educational content and occasionally additional announcements. Keep up the good work and study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams, so prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.